Hey everyone, how's it going? Um, welcome back to Christ is the Cure. Uh, today's episode is going to be a little bit scatterbrained and um, just kind of random. We're going to be talking about some of the stuff that I've posted up and interactions online and things of that nature. Um, because last week we had the discussion on the Honest Youth Pastor uh, YouTube channel um, on universalism with Ethan um, Carth, Cathro, I think that's how you pronounce his last name. If you're, if you're listening, Ethan, I apologize for that. And overall, the discussion was, was good. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit here, um, in a bit, but, um, I, yeah, for, first things first is that if, if you're on Patreon and you haven't picked up the discussion notes, I put up my debate notes or discussion notes up on Patreon for those in the second tier and up. Um, in terms of our financial goal to you know to press on and and to to keep expanding, we as of right now, and I'm recording, you know, a week in advance. I am sitting at ninety eight percent. So we we only need a few more, like I think it's like two or three more second tier or um, two or three more third tier, something like that. It, it, it's very little, and so. Well, we're just about there, and then I'll set up the next goal for the for the next year, which is going to be the maximum uh, goal for me. And then I have a historiaecclesiastica.org that launched, and I'm trying to update that weekly or biweekly. Uh, really, the universalism discussion threw me off because I focused a lot of energy on that, and so I didn't. So my schedule got moved around quite a bit, and then I decided not to make episodes on particular topics and instead take a different route. Uh, and I have that flexibility since we're at 98% of our um, financial goal. So that's that's a nice perk of being able to say, well, we're going to do another season so I can cover this stuff later. And some of those things that want to be covered uh, in another season and next season, uh, there's a lot of people who want me to talk about cessationism versus continuationism. Um, and I think I'll do that because I've been reading up on that behind the scenes. I'm kind of dipping my toes in, in many... Uh, many little uh, buckets right now. That makes no sense. But uh, so let's, let's talk about the debate first. So the debate went, or I keep calling it a debate. It, it's supposed to be a discussion. It, it came out like a debate. Uh, it, it's funny because during the discussion, Michael on his youth pastor's video camera went out. So some of the clips I was sharing online had three boxes with just Ethan and I visible and Michael was not visible. And so some people were thinking, what, honest youth pastor is is a universalist it's like no he he's the invisible host in in the box that you can't see <laughs> um but he was a great host he, he did a great job um and uh ethan was was fantastic to discuss with i appreciated um his approach i mean obviously whenever you talk about something like that it's going to be polemical especially with the angles we're coming from i mean i i'm calling his position heresy and he denies that, right? And so there's going to be a little bit of polemics there. And uh, and sometimes whenever it comes to like just general discussions, whenever it comes to like cross-examinations, what people don't usually realize is that whenever someone is asking another person a question in that setting, they're allowed to cut off the person and say, wait, wait, I want you to stop because I have another question for you and I don't want you to use my time. So I did that and um, made it clear that Ethan could do the same. But overall, the discussion was really respectful. Um, there was a lot of interesting... Uh, bits and pieces that I picked up on that um, I, I thought about doing a, a overall analysis for, but really Ethan's first session focused on Aeonios and the idea of how we understand eternal, which really that, that recent proposal by Romelli and by uh, David Hart, David Bentley Hart, who, who kind of echoes Romelli, uh, is a recent proposal that is challenged by linguists, and you can find many articles on that. So I didn't really even address that. In fact, if you're on Facebook uh, and you want to be in an interesting group, there's a group called, uh, they changed the name fairly recently, Nerdy Biblical Language Majors. And if you search the term Aeonios, you see plethora of discussion on that term. 
So I wasn't too concerned about that issue. I decided to go with a broader approach. And then in my second session, I started quoting various literature, you know, from what we're talking, the, the Fifth Ecumenical Council through the Seventh, and then even a Greek spokesman at Florence. And then I cited the position of the Catholic Church and then a liturgy that was formed allegedly in the Eighth uh, in the 800s and used today by Greek Orthodox, or Greek Orthodox adherents and so on and so forth. So I try to be broad and, uh, and I think overall it was, a, I, I left thinking that was neutral. I'm, I'm content. I, I wasn't particularly happy. I wasn't particularly disappointed. Um, I do think that during the cross examination, there were a few admissions that were important. Um, for example, if you're on my Instagram, you saw the clip I put up where I asked Ethan, whenever someone who's not a universalist preaches the gospel, is it actually good news? And he said, no, not even close, which is an indication that we're teaching two different gospels. And whenever I called him on that, there was kind of a backtrack. Uh, but that's really what it boils down to. And then he says that the traditional view or the view that's not universalism is dangerously close to heresy. And so I thought it was interesting that the whole time he was pushing back against this idea. And he, and he's talked about this in his blog too, um, where uh, it's wrong to call his position heresy, but he's calling the view held by most Christendom. Well, you can't even say most Christendom, nearly all Christendom, because universalism has been such a fringe group historically, uh, holds to heresy. That That's kind of strange. And so that was an interesting point. And then I thought it was interesting that he agreed with me on evangelism. But I'm not going to go too much into reviewing that. I'll leave that to um, folk who want to just go watch it. You can find it. On the website, it has its own posts. And then, uh, of course, the Honest Youth Pastor uh, YouTube channel, if you just look it up there. Uh, I was originally going to do some episodes on universalism, but really, I I condensed a lot of what I was going to say in some episodes into like 15-minute blocks. Uh, really, the, the historical documents is what got me excited because finding that there was a consistent line of evidence, because I, I always heard, you know, Schaff, Wace, McDermott, uh, Richard Bauckham, he, he sort of doubted the condemnation at the Fifth Ecumenical Council because um, uh, I don't remember why. But Philip Schaff and Wace, I mean, they say that there's an abundance of subsequent literature that confirms the Fifth Ecumenical Council. And whenever I found that, um, I was excited, especially whenever I found weird fringe things like Pelagius at the Synod of Diospolis before the Fifth Ecumenical Council trying to distance himself from originist views, specifically saying that those who believe in universalism are originists. I was, it was interesting. I was having fun with that. So I had fun with the prep. Um, I'm kind of done talking about it for a little bit. I did engage a little bit with the comments on YouTube, and I may go back and forth on that since I'm recording now, and this will be posted a week later, you know, time travel. Um, so yeah, with, with that, some things that we can talk about here are the the Catholicism posts and the Bethel posts that I put up. And after this episode, which is a little bit of a filler, just kind of laid back, um, which is not normal anymore for the show, we are going to discuss the concept of Christians being people of the book, which is going to be pushing back against the idea that Christians didn't know their Bible. They just relied on behavior to evangelize and things like that. That's a very popular notion. So we'll talk about that um, in detail with hopefully some interesting factoids as we go through it. But let's talk about Catholicism. So I actually put up one, two, three, four, five, five posts on Catholicism in two weeks. And I'll probably put up more before this episode is published um, about arguments that Protestants shouldn't use against Catholicism. I'm working on reading and putting together posts on that. But the first one was, no, there are not, you know, 33,000 denominations because of Protestantism. And if you're on social media, on Instagram or Facebook, you, you saw these. So you can go to Christ.is.the.cure and swipe down. And if you look for Kermit, there are three posts with Kermit the Frog sipping tea. And that's kind of how I, I find them easily myself, believe it or not. And that's just, I put it there. So I was like, oh, I can find these later. Uh, but what's interesting is that I'm, I'm explaining where the 33,000 myth came from. And there were a lot of Catholics that shared this and said that the post was ridiculous because it says that there are 
242 Catholic denominations. And I was, and I had to explain to them, this, this isn't what I'm saying. This is what the source that Catholics use against Protestants say. And it was just kind of a weird, like, guys, you, you got to see what I'm saying because, because it's weirdly ironic. And then there were some discussions on the papacy that were interesting and about the Apocrypha. But what really was fascinating was the post about rumors of Catholic unity are greatly exaggerated. Um, a lot of Catholics disagreed with it. The ones that commented on my post were those who agreed with Vatican II. And what's interesting is that there was a discussion on a Catholic podcast that came out the same time uh, that was a position of a Catholic who disagreed with Vatican II and another position who agreed with Vatican II, and they were debating why and the validity of the papacy and things of that nature. So it was really interesting to to have that debate come out whenever I have Catholics tell me that Catholics are unified. At the same time, you have bishops defying the papacy and allowing um, for, uh, what was it? Something to do with homosexuality in, Be in Belgium, I think. It just all these ironic things popping up at the same time when I'm saying, listen, you know, you guys are saying that you're united, but there's a lot of turmoil underneath the surface and y'all don't have the unity that, that you leverage against Protestantism. And really, uh, here's what I'm thinking. And, and I know that I'm not the only one who thinks this. I think that Catholicism is on the verge of a pretty big conflict and it kind of centers around what began with Vatican II, because there's a lot of Catholics that disagreed with Vatican II. Some think that, um, well, you know, it, it's ecumenical. Um, it, we have to accept it, but we don't have to assent to everything in it. And then there's those who say that, no, we don't accept it at all. It's the progressive progressive ideology that's been expressed. We hold to Vatican I, and we hold the trend. And then there's others who say, no, it's completely binding. If you don't hold to it, you're not part of the church. And that's really what I was seeing. I had these Catholics tell me that everyone's united, but they were telling me that they're united based on their own view. So I had a bunch of people telling me, well, you have to hold the Vatican II, and if you don't, then you're not a Catholic. And then on the other flip side, someone said, well, we, we can hold the Vatican II, but we don't have to agree with everything they say. Uh, so I was getting conflicting uh, you know, projections of unity whenever they were saying that. But at the same time, there was another article that came out saying, um, talking about women priests in Catholicism. And then, of course, you have Catholics decrying that. Whenever I talked to one individual who believed that Vatican um, II's uh, council is valid, but you don't have to assent to everything. I, I said, well, okay, but people are disagreeing with you. So how do you deal with that? He's like, well, you know, everything can be challenged, but it's just an interesting dynamic. But really, um, my, my thrust of my post that I thought was interesting because some people who held the Vatican to push back against what I was saying was I, I said that Catholics should reject the ecumenical council of Vatican II. And of course I'm presupposing what the, what these people are saying that, uh, according to them, this is ecumenical. It is um, the teaching of the magisterium assisted by the Holy Spirit, according to the Catholic Catechism 688. Um, and that this is with the authority of you know Christ. This is um, guarded from doctrinal error, and it's binding. It's not optional, right? And, and I'm going with those Catholic presuppositions, saying that there's good grounds to reject this council and that causes an issue with those catholic you know presuppositions um there was one individual who told me that my interpretation of vatican II was wrong but then i was just quoting catholic sources saying that he didn't understand what it was saying uh and it was kind of interesting let's see um <clears throat> uh, uh looks like he might have deleted his comment uh, but yeah, he, he was trying to say that my interpretation was wrong. So what was I saying? Well, um, Vatican II says that Muslims and the Catech uh, Catechism of the Catholic Church, 841, states that Muslims together with us adore the one merciful God. The documents of Vatican II uh, states that they worship the one God. Uh, so basically saying that we worship the same God um, as creator. Now, they do admit, and I clarify that because for some reason people didn't, see that part in that post. They do admit that there's major errors. They are profoundly wrong. Catholic answers, Tim Staples states, thus we Catholics have to be careful to distinguish between the fact that Muslims believe in the one true God, living and is subsisting in himself, merciful and all-powerful, the creator of heaven and earth, and the fact that they get it wrong, profoundly wrong, when it comes to both what God has revealed in himself and in the New Testament. 
So they recognize the heirs of Islam, but they still say that they worship the same God uh, in accordance with him as creator. The problem with this is that um, Islam was founded with a with a baseline against Christianity. It, w- it was founded after Christianity had been in existence for several hundred years and after uh, doctrines on the Trinity had been, form- uh, been formally formulated, right, with precise articulations. And they can't claim an ignorance, but they openly and blatantly reject the Trinitarianism and the sonship and deity of Christ at its inception. Uh, and I think it's clear that that to say that they worship the same God is blasphemy, especially whenever we're talking about Jesus, who says, whoever denies me denies the Father. They, they don't have the Father. They, they don't have the Father in any shape or form. Um, 1 John 2, 22 through 23 says, who, who is the liar if not if it is not the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. Who denies the Father and the Son? Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father, but whoever confesses the Son has the Father as well. Uh, Islam blatantly denies that Jesus is the Son. And John calls that person an Antichrist. There, there's not, we both worship the same God. This isn't this isn't a claim to ignorance. Uh, 2 John 1 9 says, everyone who does not go ahead and abide by the teaching of Christ does not have God. And what is the teaching of Christ? That he is the Son of God and that he um, is the only way to the Father and he's the only one who can access the Father. Um, Matthew 10 33, but whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Uh, John 4 23 through 24 says that we have to worship in spirit and truth. And so uh, I think it's clear that John places these groups that deny Jesus as he's revealed in scripture as the Antichrist, especially son. The sonship is blatantly laid out that those who deny that Jesus is the son are of the Antichrist. They do not have the father. But the Catholic Church in Vatican II says, well, they worship the same God as creator. But no, fundamentally, it's different. If you don't worship Jesus as God, then you don't have God. To deny Jesus's deity is to deny God. Um, and so there, I don't, regardless of how many philosophical reasons are placed to say that, you know, they worship the same God as Christians, they are fundamentally different. Um, even the idea of oneness, uh, and I, and I told a Catholic this, a Catholic was like, well, you know, they, they worship the one God, um, as we worship the one God. I was like, yeah, but they worship a unipersonal God, which is no different than the modalists. Like, how can the Catholic Church simultaneously say that modalists are heretics, they don't worship the same God because they believe that God is unipersonal, but then say that Islam worships the same God because they believe that he is the one true God? Well, so do modalists. They both believe that they're unipersonal. They deny the Trinity. They deny um, at least the orthodox articulation of the Trinity in modalist case because, you know, semantics can make them say that they believe in the Trinity in some shape or form. So, yeah, I don't think that it's appropriate to say that they worship the same God at all. I think it's an error, and I think it's an error that should not be attributed to the Holy Spirit, as the Catholic Catechism says. Ecumenical councils are guided by the Holy Spirit from error. And they teach with the authority of Christ. Whenever Christ clearly says, uh, quite contrary many times, that you need to know who he is properly to, to say that you have the Father. Um, if, if Jesus critiques the Jews at, in his day for not recognizing him and saying that they don't have the Father, instead that their father is the devil for rejecting him, then why would we say that Muslims have the one true God in some shape or form? Uh, so that's... That's one of the things. Also, um, I did get the book Scribes and Scripture, switching gears here. Uh, it's the amazing story of how we got the Bible by John Mead and Peter Gurry. Fantastic introductory work. It didn't cover everything I wanted to. It's because, I mean, I was probably expecting more because I'm a little bit more into the weeds in the subject than other people. But it's a great introduction into textual criticism, canon, stuff like that. Highly recommend it. Um, I like those guys a lot, honestly. And they also have a conference you can, uh, the Texan Canon Institute, if you look that up, they have a conference, I think they advertise in the back of the book, that you can sign up your church for to get the contents of a book for your congregation in a conference type form. Uh, Switching gears again already, I was originally going to make an an episode on the reasons why I'm still critical of Bethel Church, Uh, but then I decided just to make a post, and so I guess this will kind of fill that gap. Now, the, I put one of the reasons why I'm still critical of Bethel Church 
Um, and I said, you know, to note before proceeding, I did not believe that Bethel discussions should be reduced to charismatic versus reform or continuation versus cessationism. I think that's overcorrection or reductionistic. I think that that's a weird approach. Uh, and I still had people who, who said, you know, that the, that's what I was doing. And I, I don't understand. But uh, anyway, so I said that Bethel has continuously placed experiences over scripture. Uh, Bethel further has been happy to embrace syncretism of new age ideology and practices, uh, which elaborates their frequent expressions of word of faith ideology. I said to demonstrate this one could read the book, the physics of heaven. Uh, the preface is written by Bethel's leadership. Uh, the Johnsons that's, that's, um, Benny and Bill wrote two chapters themselves. And then Chris Valaton, I believe wrote, um, I think he wrote the preface. I, I don't remember at the top of my head. But um, it's sold in Bethel's bookshop, and it has this description, quote, when uh, read what some of the most beloved leaders in the Christian charismatic movement have to say as they explore the mysterious, the, the mysteries of God hidden in sound, light, uh, vibrations, frequencies, energy, and quantum physics. Um, now, uh, this book utilizes what's called quantum mysticism, which is a pseudoscience. If you read what um, people in science say about this ideology, they they get kind of annoyed. Um, there's a lot of articles on it, but it's blended. It's basically this idea of quantum physics being blended with new age ideology. Now, Ellen Davis is one of the contributors of the book, and she outlines the five beliefs of quantum mysticism in her book, uh, in this same book. And that is one, the belief in the power of consciousness and to influence material reality Two, belief in a single universal consciousness that permeates all things. Three belief in everything, even our thoughts and emotions emit, uh, energetic vibrations for belief in parallel universes and five belief that mankind is evolving to a higher level of consciousness. Now in this book, the authors admit that quantum mysticism derives from new age ideology promoted by various new age teachers, such as um, Deepak Chopra. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly yet. They claim that the new age um, appropriated these practices and ideas and says, quote, my hope is that this book will be like a red pill that allows you to wake up to the deeper understanding of God's reality. Um, you can read through the excerpts of this book that I posted. It's on my page, or you go to heavensphysics.com. You can read through excerpts yourself. Uh, basically it claims that, uh, we didn't want to become new age. We wanted to see if they had uncovered some truths that the church hadn't yet. At the same time, other ones were saying that, well, you know, we found that the new age counterfeited what we already had. So there's a contradiction there between chapters. It's interesting. Um, one of them says that, I found at least 75 examples of things that New Age had counterfeited, such as spirit guides, trances, meditation, auras, power objects, and so forth. Uh, These belong to the church, but they have been stolen and repackaged, which I I don't know how you come to those conclusions. Meditation is the only one, really, but even how that's defined in New Age is vastly different. You can look at the authors and the contributors and go read the book. Um, But ultimately, um, in, in secular if you want to say that, or in New Age circles, quantum mysticism, as typically or practically implied or applied, uh, has these ideas. The ability to bend or alter reality via your mind, words, and desire, including self-healing. Ultimate transcendence and enlightenment is through communion with the universe. Um, thoughts have energy, and thus your inner dialogue and interpretation of that dialogue will interpret your path um, you utilize the law of attraction, and of course, this is popular in, in the in the book, the New Age book, the the Secret, which focused upon the law of attraction, where there are three steps to to living on the correct path or the path you desire, rather. That's asking, believing, and receiving, um, and that's the secular understanding. Now, you take that and apply it to Word of Faith. All of a sudden, things make sense because that's really what Word of Faith is. It's a blending of these new ideas with with Christian terminology. Um, Now, what was interesting, oh, yeah, so I I put on the end, um, you know, for more, you can listen to my False Prophet, Syncretism, New Age, and Divine Revelation podcast episode and Deification in the Christian Thought, and look at Little God Theology. Both of those talk about Word of Faith a little bit. Uh, Well, the former does in particular. Um, And then, of course, Melissa Daughtry Daughtry, um, has a... Uh, YouTube video, Bethel Church, Incorporating New Age Mysticism, Spirit Guides, R.O.S., Angels, etc. You can look up Bethel in the New Age by Doreen Virtue. She does stuff all the time. Uh, then Mike Winger. I accidentally put Mike Winder on the post. Typos. Can, I look through these posts, and I still can't catch everything. Mike Winger and Melissa Daughtry 
have a how the New Age and Word of Faith uh, misunderstand the Bible, and they they both do a great job. Ultimately, um, but what's interesting is that whenever discussions are happening, I had people start ironically judging me for judging Bethel here. And what's interesting is that I'm critiquing essentially a published public work in particular. Yeah, I, I said a couple things in the beginning about Bethel Church in general, but this is heavily propagated by Bethel. This is a public published work. This isn't something that they're teaching within their church. And so someone was like, well, how dare you critique this church that you haven't been to? Um, I was like, this is a book. I mean, it, anyone can pick up a book, review it, and critique it. Like, I, I don't understand why that's a difficult thing. But what was particularly interesting is that there was at least three instances where I asked someone who was critiquing me for critiquing this book if they had read the book themselves. Uh, one individual blocked me, one individual didn't respond to me, and the other one deflected and started saying that um, I, I shouldn't be talking about this subject. Uh, so that was interesting. But really, you can go pick up this book. I, I wasn't hiding anything. I, I quoted excerpts. Yeah, I, I can't quote the whole book. I quoted things that were... Um, but really, I thought what was most telling is that these individuals here are, are blatantly saying that they, they believe these New Age practices are, are biblical and that the New Age stole them, while Ellen Davis quotes the five beliefs of quantum mysticism and, and tries to appropriate them for Christianity and like, I, I don't know how much more clear that needs to be. Um, so, so that's interesting here. Um, really, that's all I have for this week's kind of filler episode. Next week, we'll start talking about people of the book. We're in October by next week. And so we're coming up on an episode on indulgences uh, for the Reformation special instead of doing Beyond Luther because... Um, I'm, I'm kind of scattered brain at the moment. I have, again, I've, I've been kind of focused on tasks that have distracted from uh, putting together materials the way I wanted to. Uh, and that's really why I, I don't really accept, I've been turning down invitations to go on podcasts and discuss with people on different things left and right, like just constantly. And so the honest youth pastor discussion was kind of a, well, here, here's one for the year kind of thing, <laughs> because it takes so much energy out of me to to focus on that because I, I like to be over prepared. Right. And so I, I'm glad to have that moved over. And now I can focus on other things and hopefully we can get a, a rhythm and I can get um, a schedule put together for you guys. So that said, next week, we'll talk about the people of the book. We'll talk about literacy in the ancient Greco Roman world and uh, public communal readings, which is significant. Excellent, interesting study, hopefully. And that is it for this week. If you enjoy Christ as a Cure, if you want to help us press on, become a Patreon at patreon.com uh, forward slash Christ is the Cure. If you are in the second tier, you have access to early episodes. You have access to um, Historia Ecclesiastica, which is a new website that I'm, I'm building, basically a database for... Uh, church history, which is exclusive for Patreon, uh, you know, members. And then you also have access to some courses I did for, for patrons. And I, I try to give y'all, y'all supplemental stuff. I know a lot of y'all don't really care about that stuff because you just want to support it, which is awesome. Um, but there are perks and I'm going to be trying to update Historia Ecclesiastica weekly or bi-weekly minimally. Um, and again, that's, that's a perk that you guys have. And then you have access to debate notes and PDFs for episodes. You have the PDF on the historical existence of Jesus. You have a PDF on the Apocrypha, which is a great cheat sheet, uh, if you're wanting to discuss with people in the future. Um, so, so I try to give y'all things that other people don't get to make it worth your while to show that I appreciate your support and we're, we're really close to hitting my minimum goal. And then once we do hit my minimum goal, assuming we will, I, I will um, set a new goal and that will be my cap. And um, yeah, so I, I, it's been an honor and a privilege to be able to do, do this. And it's just been, it's just been wonderful. I, I appreciate all you guys very much. And I hope you guys have a great week and a great weekend. Uh, God bless you all, and that's it. Turn your eyes to the hillside where
justice and mercy.